Welcome to the Benning Report. Coming up in this edition, Brad Pitt visits Fort Benning for a special screening. And Fort Benning's Explosive Ordnance Disposal Company prepares for deployment. Later, the Fort Benning community helps the hooch. began to see you know, the flag in a different way. We saw, see the flag through the soldiers' eyes, and it was really uh, became a moving experience. Welcome to the Benning Report. I'm Melissa Bell. And I'm David Wright with the Fort Benning Public Affairs Office. Thanks for watching. That's just a little bit of my interview with Brad Pitt. He and his co-stars visited Fort Benning soldiers to premiere their new movie about World War II tankers. We'll have the full story later in the show. And speaking of tanks, seven new armored vehicles have now been placed as monuments outside of one of Fort Benning's main gates. And the good news is, it's just the beginning of a much larger plan. The future site of the National Armor and Cavalry Museum is welcoming seven new additions. These beauties, dating back to a World War II era Persian tank, have spent months undergoing renovation at the restoration facility on Sand Hill. Now they are prepped, painted, and ready for monument duty. The restorations are the result of multiple private companies working under the coordination of the National Armor and Cavalry Heritage Foundation. What really surprised me more than anything is the volunteer spirit of the folks that came and participated in this project. They understand that they're doing something for the United States Army and we're really excited about it. Today, the support battalion from the 3rd Brigade 3rd Infantry Division are loading up four armored vehicles for transport to their new home. It is phase one in what will eventually lead to the National Armor and Cavalry Museum being built at Fort Benning. Uh, the vehicles that we have set up uh, will give us here at Fort Benning a walking path of monument vehicles that will allow people to see the part of the armor collection uh, that we're unable to see. Perhaps you have seen the tanks on display just off post outside the Benning Road gate. It is here that these four vehicles plus three more within the month will be placed. On Veterans Day, this area will be officially dedicated as Patton Park, and it is part of a 30-acre plot that has already been set aside for the future museum. This plot of land is tied to the, the, the land that houses the National Infantry Museum. It'll make it the largest military history museum complex in the United States of America and probably the world when these two museums are built and co-located in this area. The armored vehicles that will now be on display will portray the progression from World War II with the M4 Sherman and the M26 Persian, all the way up to the M1A1 Abrams family of tanks. Current plans call to open the National Armor and Cavalry Museum by the year 2020. David Wright, Fort Benning TV. According to the Center for Disease Control, as of October 8th, Ebola has infected over 8,400 people worldwide. But what is Ebola? How do you get it? And what's the Army's role in battling this virus? Katie Cook talked with a specialist to narrow down the facts. Ebola has been around since 1976, but has been making the headlines since its recent outbreak in West Africa, where nearly 5,000 cases have been confirmed. And the number is climbing. What happens is that the folks who live in Sierra Leone and, and Nigeria and Liberia who eat bushmeat end up getting Ebola virus. So bushmeat is actually bats and animals which are bitten by bats. And when undercooked, that's how the folks who live in West Africa were becoming victims of the Ebola virus and then developing the Ebola viral disease. Not only can you get Ebola through bushmeat, but also through body fluids. This includes saliva, sweat, bowel movements, blood and vomit. Once a patient is infected with the Ebola virus, the incubation period takes 2 to 21 days for the patient to become symptomatic and contagious. If 21 days ago you came across somebody you think may have had active Ebola viral disease, and it was more than 21 days ago and you're not symptomatic, the chances that you're going to develop Ebola viral disease, hemorrhagic fever, are so negligible that it would be less than 1 1 millionth of a percentile. Symptoms can include flu-like symptoms, fever, night sweats, chills, body aches, and progresses to nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. 
If a person begins showing these symptoms and has been in contact with a person infected with the Ebola virus, they should be isolated immediately and health professionals should be notified. To prevent the spread of this disease, wash your hands thoroughly with antibacterial soap or an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid contact with the infected and any items that may have come in contact with them. To help the humanitarian effort in West Africa, soldiers from the 463rd Medical Detachment Veterinarian Service Support will be deploying to Liberia to make sure all food and water products consumed by soldiers are safe to eat. For the day-to-day -day mission, this is the same as we would do anywhere. Obviously, the environment we're in does shape some of the differences. We are worried about the disease threat, and that's not just Ebola. That is malaria and yellow fever. Africa is a continent, has a vast biology that allows for more risks. Our soldiers are trained and ready to deal with all of that. The soldiers heading to West Africa will not be working directly with Ebola patients or health care providers, but will be given the latest safety equipment and following up-to-the-minute protocols as determined standard by the U.S. Army Public Health Command and CDC. For more information on the Ebola virus, visit the CDC homepage at cdc.gov. Katie Cook for Benning TV. You are what you eat, and in the Army, the bar is set pretty high. So who makes sure the products that make it into your lunchbox and onto your table is nothing but the best? We bring you a behind-the-scenes look at Fort Benning food inspectors. A family of four shopping at the commissary can save more than $4,500 on groceries in a single year, with a single service member saving more than $1,500. This valuable resource has many flocking to the commissary not only for its savings, but for its products. And the veterinarian food inspectors assigned to the commissary make sure these products are held to the highest possible standards. As a vet food inspector, we provide food safety. We want to make sure that the products here are wholesome for consumption. We offer quality assurance as well as food defense, which would be protection against intentional and unintentional contamination of food product. And that means that food hasn't been accidentally damaged or intentionally tainted. These 68 Romeos start their day at 3 a.m. when food is delivered and not only inspect the food, but transportation as well. Afterward, food is critiqued with only the highest standards accepted. Um, there are several standards that we follow. Uh, for example, for produce, we, all the products that we're supposed to get must be U.S. number one and above, and that's federally regulated. What we do is we verify the product to make sure it's meeting the grade requirements. And then for other uh, commodity or other products, we follow our SOP or whatever's on the con contract. We're going to make sure that the box is good. Nothing's been broken on the box. It's not covered in dirt. Everything appears to be good. Can open the case up. We're going to start looking at the product, making sure that everything's good on it. It doesn't have any blemishes, scars, anything like that. We're going to look around throughout the case, make sure everything looks good, make sure there's nothing moldy, nothing rotten, that our customers are getting the best product possible and the government's getting what it's paid for. Nothing looks spoiled. Essentially what you're looking for is something that um, you would be willing to eat or to serve to your family and make sure it's good product, make sure that the government is getting what it's paid for. And if the quality is subpar, recommendations are made to refuse the product. They usually reject the product and they follow our recommendation because they do have confidence in what we do and from all the training that we go through. But on this day, all the product looks good and will be placed on the floor, ensuring that items are placed in a first-in, first-out system to avoid spoiling and wasting of government money. Walking through the commissary several times daily, these food inspectors check everything from food placement to prep to holding and cleanup. The pre-op inspections are done in the morning before the store opens and before any, any processing is done. And the post-op is done at the end of the night after the store is closed and everything has been sanitized. Trained in microbiology, deterioration and diseases, these inspectors make sure all prep areas are cleaned and maintained to standard by swabbing for living organisms several times monthly. Depending on the surface, whether it be the plastic of the cutting board or the stainless steel of the knife, we'll get an acceptable reading. I think it's very important that we execute up to standards because we want to meet the health and the welfare of our service members, their families, our retirees, and also that we want to make sure that the government gets what it's paid for. Safety remains the top priority for these unsung heroes that make sure you can feed your family with confidence while saving those precious pennies. Melissa Bell, Fort Benning TV. Later in the show, Hollywood comes to Fort Benning.
Soldiers from Explosive Ordnance Disposal amped up their training in preparation of their imminent deployment. I joined them as they trained for a full range of threats. The 789th Explosive Ordnance Disposal Company at Fort Benning is preparing for a deployment and with that comes intense training in the lead up to the departure date. Since a lot of the EOD soldiers in question do not have any deployment experience, they are excited to have the opportunity to take their mission outside of the continental United States. Our unit's constantly on response and we have a real world mission that we um, have to prepare for at all times. So we're, we're constantly ready, but uh, when we come down on a deployment order, we have to do all the pre-deployment training and get ready to take our jobs overseas, which is a little bit different than our CONUS response. Now turn left. There should be something on the ground a foot from you. Today is the validation exercise that will verify if soldiers meet competency and preparedness standards to be sent downrange. Eight different lanes have been set up, each with a different type of threat that EOD may be called upon to handle. The VALX is conducted under the scrutiny of outside observers from Fort Campbell. It's better to have an outside view of just to see exactly an unbiased view of to see how well our teams are working together. While the activity on all eight lanes are tracked in the Tactical Operations Center, the EOD teams are going through exercises ranging from dismantling improvised explosive devices, suicide vest responses, chemical threats, and post-blast analysis. The validation exercise is the capstone event in which the soldiers are confirmed to be ready for deployment, but it comes at the end of a much more intense period of training. Uh, the main bulk, the main effort took place at Fort Polk, Louisiana during the month of August where the 789th integrated in with uh, 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division uh, and they were able to uh, liaise and begin their coordination for their uh, mission in Afghanistan. A lot of the soldiers being sent over this time have never deployed before and 1st Lieutenant Minch says they are all excited to have the opportunity to conduct their mission overseas. David Wright, Fort Benning TV. Stay tuned to see Brad Pitt, Shia LaBeouf, and their co-stars pay a visit to Fort Benning. Looking for a job is a full-time job, and with so few positions to go around, everything counts when you represent yourself to an employer, and that includes your resume. Join me as I take a look at how soldiers can best position themselves for the job market as they transition out to the civilian sector. Sixty vendors participated at a job fair held at Fort Benning in which the goal of this event is to connect soldiers with potential employers. But this job fair is the beginning of the end for this face-to-face -face event. As a result of e-benefits, which is a part of the new Veterans Employment Center, after meeting with counselors to perfect their resumes for the civilian world, all soldiers are required to upload their resume into the database, making resume workshops more crucial than ever. We help them understand how to translate their skills if they need to. But ultimately, we translate the skill here. So by the time the soldier submits their resume to the employer, there's nothing to translate. The soldier already knows, this is what I did, this is how it translates, and they don't need to know that part. All they need to know is, how do I, how do I qualify for that particular job? That's what that counselor is for, to help them pull out from their career skills what they need to put in that resume now to in order to qualify them for that new position. 
In the future, employers will be selecting soldiers from an online forum instead of meeting them in person, which means their resume will have to be a living document, able to change quickly and mailed out at any time. A resume is a great tool. It is your chance when you're doing a job application, it's your two-page sales pitch. And that's hard for some people to understand that you're putting your whole life in two pages and trying to sell yourself to somebody who doesn't know you from Adam. And so it's really important they put as much as they can, make it as pointed as, possibly can, as they possibly can, because we really want to know everything about them. While military life revolves around acronyms, civilian life does not. During a resume workshop, soldiers are shown the importance of communication when applying to civilian jobs. The best thing to do or, or think about when you're constructing your resume is think about the relevance of what you're putting down. So everything that you're proud of might not be as relevant to the job that you're applying for. The civilian language is, is the target language. You know, if soldiers uh, end up using their military jargon or military language, then civilians won't understand it. And so that breakdown in communication you know, makes the soldier not as enticing to hire. When looking at job postings, focus on the keywords, then use those words to build your own resume. First thing that you got to do is get your foot in the door. And the way to do that is research. Research the company, research the job posting, learn how to target that posting. And then once all that happens and they actually call you for an interview, then, that, then you move on to the next phase. A soldier's goal when writing their resume should be to portray to the employer that they have successfully transitioned from the military and is a ready-made employee equipped for hire. Melissa Bell, Fort Benning TV. You'd be surprised to see what was pulled from the Chattahoochee River during this year's Help the Hooch. Katie Cook visited with volunteers who put garbage back where it belongs. When you take a walk along the Chattahoochee River, you shouldn't see bottles, tires, or garbage. But unfortunately, you do. So soldiers, family members, and friends of the Chattahoochee River volunteered during this year's annual Help the Hooch. What many people don't realize is how much their one piece of trash can impact the ecosystem surrounding the river. It actually helps teach people, you know, throwing a bottle on the ground, it really does infect your streams and your local waterways and the rivers. They can actually see how much trash we pick up every year. Keeping the Chattahoochee River clean is vital not only for wildlife and recreational activities, but for our own water consumption as well. Our waterways are very important, and even though water is kind of like an unlimited resource, it's finite in a point because we only have so much that gets regenerated, and it's finite because if it's not clean water, we can't use it. Kayaks were loaded with garbage from the waterways, and banks were cleared of debris in a team effort to keep Fort Benning a beautiful place to enjoy the outdoors. It was a great learning tool for our soldiers, and it was a great way to help everyone out and uh, be able to just be able to give back to and help the environment. If you plan on heading outside to enjoy the beauty of the Chattahoochee, remember to take your trash with you and help keep Fort Benning the beautiful place it is. Katie Cook, Fort Benning TV. Coming up next, Hollywood actors screen their new movie for Maneuver Center Soldiers. The annual Doughboy Bowl is not far away, but did the Fort Benning Doughboys get caught looking ahead? Katie Cook has the story. Fort Benning Doughboys had added hardships as they battled out a home game with Faulkner. While the offense started strong, third quarter told a different story reflecting a final score of 33-10. We're not scoring. We're not getting the ball in the end zone. We're, we're moving between the 10-yard line and the 10-yard line, and then when we get down to the 10-yard line, we're just kind of not punching it in. Uh, then we turn the ball over late, then we get kind of behind. I mean, defense is playing lights out, and uh, we got to start you know, playing from front instead of behind like we did the first two games. With four starters injured during the previous game, the Doughboys were restricted before the game even began. They started off with a successful quarter with a 51-yard touchdown pass and an extra point kick, which led them 7-0. to Defensively, we, we, did, we did well. We did well against them last time, too. I felt that we sputtered on offense. Third quarter was atrocious. That, that really put the nail in the coffin because even going to the fourth quarter, we were only down by two touchdowns. We were still in the game, but we just didn't have that, that spark to where, hey, we can score in one play kind of offense, and it's just it's a struggle right now for us to get yards. Even though the Doughboys' record stands at 2-3, and three, the success or failure of their season will be determined by the result of the upcoming game against Columbus State. So now the focus turns to preparation for that showdown and it starts with keeping players healthy. Everybody walked off the field no injuries. I mean, last time we played and we lost four starters to injuries. This is their full-time job. This is two nights a week. Let's play on Sundays because 
you know, this is something great that MWR and Fort Benning does for these guys. You know, they're not out there practicing five days a week like all the teams were playing. And to be able to walk off with no injuries is probably the most important thing, to be honest. As the fifth annual Doughboy Bowl approaches, the biggest game of the season, the Doughboys plan on using the next two weeks to practice smart and rest up. Columbus State has never beat them, and the Doughboys will make sure that doesn't happen this time. We plan to do what we've done in years past, just go out there and dominate Columbus State. We've got, we've got a week off to really iron out the kinks, so this, uh, this upcoming Doughboy Bowl, we're just going to do what we do, play Doughboy football, execute, and keep that trophy here on Fort Benning. The Doughboy Bowl takes place on October 23rd at Doughboy Stadium. It's free and open to the public. Katie Cook, Fort Benning TV. Fort Benning rolled out the red carpet for Hollywood. I had the opportunity to follow the director and stars on their tour of the Maneuver Center, where they visited Fort Benning soldiers in a special advanced screening to premiere a tank movie to remember. Fort Benning soldiers had a rare treat as cast members from the movie Fury held a special screening in their honor. There to meet with soldiers was director David Ayer, Brad Pitt, Shia LaBeouf, Michael Pena, and Logan Lerman. We talked about this, you know, early on in the shoot. Wouldn't this be great if we could do this? We had so much respect, you know. It became very important to us, so it's everything to be here today, and it's the, um, it's the ultimate response for the film. The movie Fury portrays the heroic actions of a World War II tank crew and the bonds of brotherhood they forged during the horrors of war. What do you want to do? You want to sit here? We're going to hold this crossroad. You cross want to sit road. here hold off the SS battalion? No, it's not what I want to do, but it's what we're doing. In my research and, and talking to the veterans and talking to the guys and talking to guys who go downrange today, in my own experience, it's really about the guys. And, and that's what this film is, is it's, it's, it's a day in the life of a military unit, day in the life of five guys, a tank crew, just trying to stay alive in, in real bad circumstances. Best job ever. Man. Best job ever. <laughs> Best job ever. I hadn't seen a, a film that really got into the, and dissected a, a tank crew, the life of a tank crew. But more than that, it was just, just like family, the story about a family in, the, in, in dealing with the horrors of war. And it didn't, it didn't sugarcoat it in any way for me. And, and, uh, and, and so I said yes. And then it became like a three months of, of just preparation um, of training and, and getting to understand as tourists, but a little bit of, of what these guys put forth as far as body and mind. And, and uh, it was a profound experience. Yeah. You know, working with these tanks, you know, every day being in them, uh, seeing how extremely dangerous they are and how hard it was to work in those conditions, it's, it's really humbling to think about what, what those, uh, those men went through. And those men and women are why the cast of Fury came to Fort Benning, the home of the infantry and the home of the armor, where soldiers had a chance to show them the technology and tanks of today, even giving Brad Pitt a tour of the M1 A2 Abrams. Is this turret moving or no? No, no that's, it's just that's, the camera. That's it. He's way over there. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I mean, they got way more guts than we do. You know, we just try to portray it in, on, uh, on screen. And these guys actually, you know, they, they're uh, willing to give their lives for our country, for our freedom. You know, like my parents were immigrants and came to this country because of the American dream and they're the ones keeping it uh, strong. It's kind of unbelievable, to be honest with you. And I'm like, you just can be nothing but thankful. And that's exactly how the soldiers felt about their visit. Grateful to capture a selfie and an autograph. A moment of time they will always remember. I just want to say thank you for coming down here and appreciating us and showing your love for us. It's nice. Uh, if I could say anything to them. Thanks for coming, and uh, thank you for taking time to, to talk to us and take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa Bell, Fort Benning TV. So did you enjoy meeting Brad Pitt? Oh, David, what do you think? It's not the kind of thing that happens every day. I don't understand the big deal when you get to see me every day. I miss Brad Pitt already. And that will bring this edition of The Benning Report to an end. But you can watch these stories and others on youtube.com slash TV or at benning.army.mil. And you can also like us on Facebook. From the Public Affairs Office, thanks for watching.